Paula. Thank you. But uh, we, Paul and I, Paul Bonoyan and I were up in Lansing just on Thursday and got to hear Representative Pohatsi sort of do a very humble introduction because she's saying, we want to hear what the doctors have to say about this Reproductive Health Act. But Lori is a person that's quite impressive with for for all of her commitments. And she is currently the speaker pro tem for the House. Uh, she um, sits on the, uh, she studied at Michigan State University, worked in the fields of food safety, healthcare. Uh, she uh, did her part in being a community activist and she was protesting at the Capitol before she was a legislator. Uh, she demonstrated the importance that everyone has a voice in government. And that's pretty cool too for democracy. Uh, she's chair of a natural resources and, env and environmental committee. And she's the, a member of the health policy subcommittee on behavioral health. So those are enough biographical things to show you that Lori's kind of involved and in quite an activist uh, a legislator. So again, thank you, Lori, for being here. Uh, so Lori will be doing our presentation on the new Reproductive Health Act. And so take it away, Lori. Thank you so much for having me, Randy. And thank you all for, for joining me this morning and allowing me to talk to you about the RHA, the Reproductive Health Act. Uh, so as Randy mentioned, we had our first hearing ever on it uh, this past Thursday. This is the third time that this bill package has been introduced, uh, and each time it has fallen by the wayside. But obviously, dynamics have shifted in Lansing, um, and also with the passage of excuse me, uh, Prop 3 last year, it's more important than ever that we finally get the Reproductive Health Act passed. So uh, speaking of Prop 3, a lot of folks, I tend to think not very many on this call, uh, but some folks in the state thought that uh, abortion access was kind of a settled question after Prop 3 passed. We have this uh, constitutional right to reproductive freedom, including abortion in our state's constitution. But the fact of the matter is we also have uh, what's known as trap laws on the books. So trap is targeted restrictions on abortion providers, um, targeted regulations on abortion providers, excuse me. Um, and those were put into place in the last 15 years or so uh, to disproportionately impact only abortion providers. So I want to be very, very clear. We are talking about laws that apply only to abortion, no other type of health care in our state. Uh, and the purpose of those laws was to make it more difficult for clinics to open, make it more difficult for patients to afford or be able to get to those clinics, and therefore make abortion less accessible for people in our state. And that's a problem because, uh, I mean, it's been a problem, right? We, we want to make sure that people can access the health care they need. But with the passage of Prop 3, it became an even more acute problem because a right isn't really a right if you can't access it. And uh, voters were very, very clear. They think that abortion is something that should be protected within our state's constitution, which means that it should be accessible for folks. So the Reproductive Health Act repeals a number of uh, onerous restrictions and medically unnecessary regulations on abortion providers. So things like 24-hour mandatory waiting periods. I want to be clear, there's no other health care in the state of Michigan that requires a patient to go to their doctor, undergo the informed consent that is part of every medical procedure, and then wait 24 hours. Uh, there's also state-mandated medically inaccurate information that has to be handed to patients when they go to uh, an abortion uh, appointment. So things from looking at photos of uh dead fetuses. And I, I venture to say supposedly dead fetuses, because unfortunately, we know that a lot of those images are actually not even accurate. Um, information about parenting and adoption and, and other options, which again, to be clear, part of informed consent when you go to any medical procedure is talking about the procedure itself, um, other options that a person may have. And as was brought up in the hearing on Thursday, um, not necessarily everyone, but some people who are going to receive an abortion 
don't really want to be there. And it's very, very cruel for them to have to see information about parenting and adoption for a pregnancy that they would continue if they were able to. There, there's no um, there's no demarcation about, you know, who is, is receiving this information. If you are going in for an abortion appointment, you are have you have to receive this information. Um, and again, there's no other procedure that the state mandates uh, that people see any type of state provided information. Um, this bill package also includes the repeal of the private insurance ban. Uh, currently in Michigan, if you are going to have an insurance plan, a private insurance plan that covers abortion, you have to purchase an additional rider. Um, if you do not, so again, if you are someone who is not planning on having to have an abortion, and you do not have that rider. We heard people who then had to face $10,000, $26,000 hospital bills because it's not just the procedure at that point. It's the other associated medical costs as well. Um, and if you are on Medicaid, you currently cannot get any coverage, period, for abortion procedures. So this uh, bill package repeals that as well. Um the, that's the the overarching view of all of it on Thursday, as as Randy mentioned. Um, I wanted to focus really on the doctor, the the provider, and the, the patient uh, perspective of all of this. When these laws were put into place, we didn't hear from doctors, we didn't hear from patients. We just heard from politicians who had very strong opinions on whether or not people should be able to access abortion, and they were asserting their opinion and their will and their preference on their constituents. So that's why I thought it was so important to hear from, from doctors and people who have been impacted by these laws. Um, so that's the the long and short of it, but I would love to, to take questions on any or all of this. Oh, I'm sorry, you know what? No, there, there is one other really important thing. Uh, so, uh, those additional trap laws, in addition to the, the mandatory waiting period and the the uh, inaccurate information. There's also regulations on what facilities can provide abortions. So currently in Michigan, uh, it, facilities have to be licensed as a freestanding surgical center, so an ambulatory surgical center. That is despite the fact that surgery is not performed during abortion of any type. Uh, the vast majority of abortions currently are medication abortions, which involves taking two pills. Uh, and even procedural abortions do not involve surgery. This was a, a point of contention during the hearing. It, it appears that one of my colleagues did not realize that abortion does not involve surgery. There's no incision made or anything like that. So uh, requiring that facilities be licensed and have the equipment for uh, a surgical center is has led to what we refer to as an abortion desert. If you if you look at a map of where there are um, clinics available, anything north of just slightly higher than mid Michigan, there are no clinics. So if you were in northern Michigan, if you were in the UP, you are going to have to drive hundreds and hundreds of miles, up to seven hours, to access a clinic because these restrictions are too onerous and again completely unnecessary uh, for many places to open and be able to afford to open and stay open. Um, so again, we're, we're looking to repeal those. That's not to say that there won't be regulations and licensing and standards for abortion uh, facilities. All healthcare facilities in the state of Michigan are licensed, regulated, inspected. This would not change any of that. Uh, it would just mean that they don't have to be licensed to do something that they do not and have never done. So are we ready for questions or comments or discussion? I don't know if there's anything else you want to share right now, but maybe you could share, well, af after people ask their basic questions, I got a kind of a question about what's next after the hearing that was had, held on Thursday, but that maybe could come in a little bit later, perhaps. And also our group does take positions on issues. And I'll just say from the standpoint of uh, Representative Pohutsky is that the Gray Panthers uh, were on record and, and took action to support Prop 3. So we were, you know, on board with that. And this is kind of like a cleanup, uh, important cleanup job. 
I see Jen Bendor's hand. Thank you, Randy. Uh, I uh, was the co-founder of the Women's Crisis Center of Ann Arbor in 1970. Uh, we had to drive women to New York State for abortions. Um, I could still probably drive to Rochester uh, in my sleep. <laughs> it's a lot of miles. And it is no fair for anybody to have to drive a lot of miles for what I view is an emergency procedure. Any woman who is seeking uh, abortion care is in an emergency. And I would not compare this to just any medical procedure. Uh, would you have to wait 24 hours to get treatment for a gunshot wound? Right. Hell no. Right. Uh, so I think we need to change the, the, the picture. And uh, as, as many brave uh, uh, women have been doing who have been coming forward and talking about their near death experiences in the last several months from not being able to access care. Um, and I personally uh, suffered from a Catholic hospital's uh, attitude uh, and they would have sent me home to bleed to death. Uh, in a miscarriage. It, 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 thank you, ACLU. Uh, they sued them for this practice. I don't know if they're going to try to continue it now with the Dobbs decision or not. Um, but w w the amount of ignorance in the country, as you point out, it, it, from the people who thought there was surgery involved, <laughs> is just stunning. Uh, ignorance on all levels about this. Uh, so I guess... One question that I would have is, is uh, what can we do as veterans of these uh, fights to uh, continue to make people aware of the reality of what women are going through and that every, every person who seeks abortion care is in an emergency. This is not a trivial matter or some uh, matter of, you know, using abortion as birth control, as I've heard over and over again, the trivialization of what is being uh, dealt with. Uh, how, how can we get behind this and, and get uh, the public to wake up that we cannot allow people with gunshot wounds to be rejected from emergency rooms? This is ridiculous. I mean, my first request for all of you is to, uh, contact your legislators and let them know whether regardless of of what side of the aisle they are on let them know how important this is tell those stories um because i would love to say that you know we we have a a pro choice majority in the house and the senate and i would love to say that this is a slam dunk and everyone understands you know how important this is and and why we need to repeal these things that's not the case uh you know there are people that don't realize these regulations have only been on the books for about 15 years, which means that from the time, I mean, let's be honest, people were obviously getting abortion care before Roe. But even if we are just looking at when abortion was legal in Michigan, so if we are just looking between when Roe was legalized and then when these laws went on the books, people were getting safe, accessible abortion care for years, for decades before a bunch of people decided to assert their preference on the rest of the state. Uh, so making sure that folks understand that um, and understand why these regulations are so onerous and lead to situations that you described, having to drive people hours, in that case, out of state and what that means for people uh, who are in desperate need of health care in that moment. Let them know. Um, I'm not trying to to jump into the question that Randy said we are going to get to earlier about what's next, but I will say reaching out to the members of the Health Policy Committee in the House is very, very important. I think that the testimony that we heard on Thursday was very poignant, was very, um, in some cases, heart-wrenching, but making sure that they understand uh, that the people that they represent are supportive of repealing these measures is is very, very important. And then also like combating misinformation within our own communities, right? I, I am not, we saw how much misinformation was there during the Prop 3 fight. This is going to be the same. You know, there, are, we already heard testimony from, I believe it was the Catholic conference that was talking about how we were uh, allowing late-term abortion. That's a whole separate conversation, but 
it's not actually in the bill package. So, you know, just combating the misinformation with our own within our own communities about what these laws would do, why they're important and what is and is not in them is going to be really, really um, helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I see uh, Jessica Jernigan's hand up. Hey, good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, I was actually in Lansing was it yesterday? No, the day before. And I yeah, stopped yeah. by your I stopped by your office to say thank you. Um anyway, um, I'm wondering if you have any advice for those of us who are dealing with uh Republican conservative legislators, like if our reps are Republican and conservative, how do we talk to them about this? Oh, that's a great you- great question. It is. It is. And it's tough because I think that um, getting support from any of my Republican colleagues is going to be tough. Um, but I would say like their their job is to listen to their constituents. And if they're going to vote in a way that their constituents are not supportive of, they need to feel pressure about that. I mean, that that has been the case for for me too. There have been times where there's been some really tough votes I've had to take where I had constituents on, you know, both sides of the issue. And you should feel pressure about that. You should feel uncomfortable about that. And particularly when, you know, I, I hate to keep going back to, you know, Prop 3 passed, Prop 3 passed, but Prop 3 did pass. And I don't think that anyone passed Prop three thinking, well, we want this right, but we don't actually care if anybody can access it or not. <laughs> you know, that makes no sense. Um, so folks that are on the conservative side already know that that they're they're voting against their constituency on this, but hearing from you regardless is really, really important. Um, I would say sh- I would say to share why this is important to you. And you know, this is this has been successful in some areas and unsuccessful in others, but this is also a matter of just people having the freedom to make their own healthcare choices. It truly is. There again, there there is no other uh, um, area of healthcare where the state asserts its preference in the way that it does on abortion care, and it is undemocratic. It is um, bordering on authoritarian. So I, I would frame it that way that that might be, um, helpful in in those types of situations. Thank you. Uh, Paul. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, representative, uh, your leadership in this, this, uh, area. Um, I was up there in Lansing on Thursday also in the overflow room. Um, and I listened to, uh, uh, several physicians um, uh, some were my colleagues speaking like dr chrisman from american college of obstetricians and gynecologists Uh, we've worked with her for several years and she's taken a real leadership on this too Um, one sadly who who testified against is a former resident of mine who i think was misleading or misled herself into thinking that that uh, there was no regulation of, of or, or consent for abortion procedures if these laws were removed. Of course, all, all uh, medical uh, activity <laughs> is regulated in a certain extent by licensure and scope of practice, et cetera. And, and everyone nowadays, you have to sign consent to walk in a physician's door uh, for any kind of treatment so certainly an abortion would would qualify for that. Um, and um, uh, I remember the days also pre Roe v. Wade when I was a student in Rhode Island and trying to help people get to New York State also, one of the first states to, to legalize abortion. Um, well, that was from the other direction. That was to go to New York City. Um, and... Uh, Let's see, what else was I going to say? Uh, oh, well, I've I've had experience myself with these trap laws as a high-risk obstetrician. I've had some patients that uh, uh, develop really severe problems in pregnancy, either medical problems themselves or discover when they very much wanted pregnancy that they have a 
developing fetus that has a severe chromosomal or developmental problem, like including no brain development. And, and uh, uh, I remember asking, uh, uh, putting pressure on the admissions people at Beaumont Hospital to admit a patient who had no insurance or who had Medicaid, knowing they would not be paid uh, to admit that patient and worry about uh, the finances later, because especially second term abortion is, is more expensive because it is a hospital type procedure. And also discovering to my dismay that uh, not only was Medicaid not going to cover a procedure, but somehow there were people in Lansing that were getting a bounty going through medical records to discover if somebody, say you were in severe heart failure in the middle of pregnancy and you had to terminate the pregnancy and that patient was in the ICU for days. Well, because if they have a termination during the hospital admission, uh, people would would go through those medical records if they had had that procedure, they wouldn't pay for any of the hospitalization, which could tens of thousands of dollars could be the bill. So uh, people are, uh, you know, most people are not aware of these kind of things. But yes, we have to. Uh, it's great that we have with Prop Three the the uh, right uh, reproductive rights enshrined in the con state constitution, but we still very much need to clean up the the laws that are on the books since Roe v. Wade clearly passed to try to make abortion less accessible. So thank you for all your work. Thank you. Are there some other questions for, for Lori? I've, I've got a couple of my own, but I want you all to have your first shot at asking yeah. a question too. Yvonne has a question. Okay, hi Yvonne, what's up? Hi, um, thank you, Representative Pol Polhowski. Um, I'm so glad that you're doing all this. And by the way, I worked on the petition for Prop 3 and I probably thank collected you. about 1,300 signatures. So, oh. <laughs> so, but anyways, um, yeah, thank you. Um, it was just great to have the petition to do something about this. Um, but um, I, I wanted to... Um, I think, first of all, I had a question. What are the bill numbers and what does each one do? Just so when I talk to my rep about it, um, I'm more informed. Is, is there like a one pager that has all in information about the bills? Um, I can work on getting a one pager. I It, it might be a two pager. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> the bill numbers are House Bill 4949 through House Bill 4959. What is okay. Um, and just to, to briefly look over them as briefly as I can. Um, the first one, 4949, is the actual creation of the Reproductive Health Act. And that deals with um, some of the repeals and other areas. But again, it also um, codifies that constitutional right in our Michigan statute as well, kind of a belt and suspenders approach. Uh, the next one deals with repeals in the public health code. Uh, so that's where we're going to get a lot of the repeals around um, like the, the mandatory delay, the dissemination of medically inaccurate information, things like that. Uh, the next one takes all of the sentence. It, it, it uh, does repeals in the sentencing guidelines. So the things that are criminalized currently would, would not be criminalized anymore. Um. The next one deals with an update to a definition. I, I will say, and I think just for everyone's situational awareness, there's a couple uh, areas of statute that have purposefully inflammatory names. And one of those is this bill. It's the Born Alive Infant Protection Act. Uh, yeah, exactly. A lot of people are reacting the same way that I am. Uh, the only change that we are making to that is um, updating a, a definition to make it a medically accurate information of abortion. Um, the, let's see, this is, oh, uh, there's a repeal. The next one is a repeal in the revised Judicature Act. So again, dealing with the criminal penalties, repealing those. 
4954 is uh, repealing language in the School Aid Act. There's some um, language in, in various areas, including in the School Aid, Aid Act, prohibiting any discussion or mention of abortion. Um, so if a, a student in crisis comes to a counselor, they are currently prohibited and funding will be taken away from schools if abortion is even mentioned. Um, and that also means if a student comes to a counselor and says, I, I think I would like to get an abortion, like you just have to shut that conversation down. So problematic for a number of ways. Um, occupational code uh, is that the repeals in the occupational code in 4955, uh, that deals with disposal of fetal remains. So things that require, uh, you know, uh, really burdensome restrictions on how medical facilities deal with fetal remains. I know we have Dr. Von Oyen on here. If there are any questions about what an appropriate disposal is versus what is required, um, I know that he can wade into that. But again, that's one of those really restrictive things that were, were put into place. There's nothing saying that if a, a parent would like to you know, like have a, a, a ceremony or a funeral or anything like that, that is perfectly permissible and, you know, perfectly fine. But again, the state uh, treating th this medical procedure different than it would others is, is part of the problem and has been an issue for facilities. Um, 4956, this is another one of those incendiary, uh, <laughs> incendiarily named uh, statutes, it's the partial birth abortion statute. Oh. So it's updating the definition of abortion in there as well. Um, and what I will say is the way that partial birth abortion is defined in Michigan statute um, applies to other procedures as well. It's purposefully unclear. It's purposefully overly expansive. So it's defined in a way that is not what op opponents have hyperbolically described as, as partial birth abortion. You know, I, I survived Catholic school for 12 years, so... I've, I've heard all kinds of uh, inaccurate information about what that procedure is, but the way that it is defined in statute goes much beyond that. So we have updated, once again, the definition of abortion in that statute, but also repealed criminal penalties, because again, if a doctor, in their opinion, needs to perform uh, a procedure that is falls into this overly expansive definition, we don't want them prosecuted for doing what they need to do to take care of their patient. And then... 4957 um, deals with the Pregnant and Parenting Student Services Act. So it repeals a prohibition on offering referrals uh, for abortion as well. Uh, and then 4958 and 4959 deal with the Medicaid piece. So 4958 repeals the ban on Medicaid covering abortion care. And 4959 is a proactive bill to establish reimbursement for that. Um, I will say that that proactive bill, we're limited in our scope with what we can discuss with the, the department because there is currently a ban in place. So that proactive bill is kind of starting to thread that needle, but there are ongoing conversations between the department and particularly independent providers uh, to make sure that things like reimbursement are, are going to be um, suitable because the last thing that we want to do uh, not to bring this down to a nuts and bolts conversation, but the last thing we want to do is to create an access issue because Medicaid reimbursement rates are currently so low that um, we, we don't want to create an artificial uh, you know, shortage of our own making because those clinics would have to close because they can't afford to operate because of the, the low reimbursement rate. So part of that conversation is currently banned from happening, but we have done as much of that, of laying the groundwork as we possibly can. And that proactive bill has, has been helpful in that endeavor as well. Um, I guess I had one more question just because I, I was, isn't there like a federal ban that you can't use Medicaid funds for abortion? So can Michigan go around that or what happens with that? The the federal ban, uh, the, the Hyde Amendment, means that you can't use federal funds for abortion care. That stays in place. There's nothing we can do about that currently. It just means that we would only be able to use state dollars um, out of the general fund. We got a fiscal analysis, too, for anyone who's interested. Uh, the House Fiscal Agency expects that allowing Medicaid coverage and with the stipulation that we could only use state dollars uh, would raise funds 
somewhere between two and $6 million. Um, and considering, I think our most recent uh, Department of Health and Human Services budget was around $45 billion, I believe. It's about 45% actually of our, our state budget. And our state budget this time was $82 billion. So it's about half of that. Um, $6 million to make sure that people, regardless of their income, can access the same level of health care that I would be able to under these bills is, um, I think, the correct and proper thing to do. But yes, yeah, so it would only allow for state dollars to be used. Uh, excellent okay, question you. there, hey, bud. Thank, thank you, because, yeah, I just, I just, um, I was on the other one with the ACLU as well, and you were on, and I, I just, I want to be more knowledgeable, so thank you. No, I appreciate it. One other thing, just because this is where we've been running into some issues with our own, with my own colleagues, um, and I hate to just have to play defense all of the time, but I want everyone to be prepared. Around the, the partial birth abortion piece, like I said, we're repealing those criminal penalties because they apply to other procedures as well. Um, but the federal ban on partial birth abortion stays in place. Again, that's not something that we can impact at the state level. So, you know, there there have been some folks who who have concerns and just trying to do as much preemptive education as we can on, on that piece has been really, really important. So I'm going to hop in and offer a couple questions that I think I know the answer to, but might be worth raising anyway. Uh, there are of course, in Michigan, having uh, the access to legal abortion means that there's uh, people from other states that want to come to Michigan. And how do, how do some of these laws impact people, let's say, if they're coming to us from Nebraska or coming to us from, you know, Ohio or other states like that? How, how are some of these barriers affecting people who are not Michigan residents? And I guess my second question was, what about people in Upper Peninsula or people in further, how, how come uh, they have problems even getting to, an, to uh, an abortion clinic? So those are my two ac access questions. There's, there's affordability questions with Medicaid, but access questions have to do with access to the, the clinics. Those are great questions. Uh, so in terms of us having patients from other states, um, States that have abortion bans in place uh, are often sending people to other states. And those access states, as those with uh, legalized abortion are, are being known as, are seeing an increase in patients from out of state. Uh, here in Michigan, we've seen roughly a 16% increase in out of state patients coming here. And that is significantly lower than other access states. That is because Michigan is not a place that people are sent to as frequently as others because we have these trap laws in place. Wow, so okay. for instance, you know, I know we heard about this in, in the, the hearing, people from Texas coming here, paying to fly here or drive here or whatever the case is, paying for lodging, and then finding out that they printed the wrong form and now they have to wait an extra 24 hours. And it's worth noting, and, and I almost don't like to bring this up because like, I don't care what your reason for needing an abortion is. It, I want you to be able to get one. But particularly in Texas, where you have people who are going septic and having profound medical complications because doctors are too afraid to actually make that call for when they are able to give an abortion, those people are having to go out of state as well. And then to, you know, be in a position like that where you get here and then are told, okay, well, I know you're scared for your life, but you have to wait an extra 24 hours because you printed the form out at the wrong time. It's abhorrent. That, that is just, it, it, it's awful. Um, so that 16% figure is lower than other states. However, it is really quite a significant jump for providers in Michigan because there are so few. So 16% is not many, it is not a huge jump in terms of, you know, other access states, but it's significant for us and it's putting a real burden on our doctors and then other patients that also need those resources. Um, so passing this bill package will be helpful in, in alleviating some of that, but it will also take time. So leading into your second question, why is it so difficult for, you know, Northern Michigan and the UP to have providers and to, and to have clinics? These facilities are very, very expensive to open because they essentially have to be ambulatory surgical suites. That's very, very expensive. A sink 
uh, a surgical scrub sink, which is currently required for any abortion provider to have, is about $10,000 just for one of them. And again, it's totally unnecessary because surgery is not being performed. The HVAC system that would have to be um, uh, purchased is an HVAC system that assumes somebody will be cut open and will have their internal organs exposed for some level of time or for some amount of time. Again, that's not happening, but it's very, very expensive. Um, additionally, there's a requirement on how close to a hospital a facility has to be. There are not very many hospitals in Northern Michigan and the UP, which drastically limits where these facilities can be and how far someone would have to drive to access one. Um, so that is not to say that, you know, we pass this law, it goes into effect, and suddenly everything will be fixed. These places will still have to find the capital to open a facility, period. But the cost of that and the, the onerous restrictions of that will be greatly lessened. So there is going to be the ability for more places to open in those areas because the overhead cost will just not be as exorbitant as it is right now. That also isn't to say, you know, we, we've been talking with some of our independent providers. If you happen to get a fire marshal who does the inspections and either doesn't understand what the regulations are and, and why they're in place and frankly, why they don't make sense, or if you just get a fire marshal that is uh, anti-abortion, you're out of luck. You're going to get shut down. You're not going to get approved to open up. That That's happened before. Uh, you know, locally, we have Northland Family Planning, and they've talked about the struggle to to move, you know, my, um, not trying to go on a whole tangent, but they wanted to move because they were being protested so egregiously. My, my niece was a clinic escort there, and they all had to shelter in place and have the FBI come out because someone showed up with an AR-15. So they wanted to move. But because of one, the cost associated with trying to find another location that would fit all of these ridiculous restrictions that are on the books that have nothing to do with patient safety, and then getting the approval from the city and all the associated departments that go into it uh, made it completely impossible for them to do so. So that's in an area where we we have the ability to, to really open these facilities. Up north, it, it's much more difficult. Made no sense. Agreed. Did anyone else have a question who hasn't uh, asked one yet so far? Mary Jo? Yeah, um, thank you. This, that was great information that you just gave. Wow. Uh, I wanted uh, the representative just to comment because I know it'll come up in conversation about a minor's ability to access abortion. My understanding is that it, it's, this, nothing has changed, but could you um, clarify that? Explain Absolutely. Uh, so previous iterations of the, the bill package had the repeal of the, the forced parental consent law. This one doesn't. And the reason for that is there was a lot of misinformation about what parental consent meant, what the current state of affairs was, and what a repeal would actually mean for the people in the state of Michigan uh, during the Prop 3 campaign. Um, I think that scared a lot of my colleagues, and I think it confused both them and, frankly, a lot of our constituents. There was a lot of really bad information. So when we were working on this bill package, that was a wall that we kept hitting. And frankly, we need more time to do some more education about what the current system is, what it would look like if it was repealed. Um, and in an effort to try and get this package through as quickly as possible and signed by the governor, we decided to pull it out at this time and work on that education while we're just moving forward with this. I'm happy to talk about parental consent. I have gone on the record with my feelings on it and why it's a problem. And you know, while yes, we all want there to be a safe, trusted parent for someone navigating this, there isn't always. Um, and sometimes that adult that is safe and trusted is not your parent. And the, the current system does not allow for, for that to, to be the case. Um, but, you know, as it as it stands right now, we just need to do some more education around that. And we are doing that at the same time that we are working to get this bill package through. Thank you. Uh, Paul, I see your hand up. Uh, just, just a couple of quick additional things. Uh, the term partial birth abortion was mentioned. And just to say that 
that is not a medical term at all. That's you. a made up term. It's yes. not in our, our textbooks. It's not something we teach our residents or medical students. Um, second of all, just the term abortion in medicine is used for both spontaneous mis uh, abortion, which we call miscarriage in, in layman terms, and induced abortion is what we would be talking about. And the same tech, well, first of all, most spontaneous miscarriages uh, uh, do not need special any special medical technique. They're, they're spontaneous over with on themselves. And uh, uh, that is true also for, for the uh, medical, medically induced abortion with the pills. That's why, that's why it's much more convenient, much cheaper. For most people, you don't need any procedure at all. In the few where you do need a procedure to complete the, the, the uh, process, is, it's the same process as what's do, done for an induced abortion is for a, uh, what we call missed abortion, an incomplete or incomplete abortion, spont incomplete spontaneous abortion. So those are those are the same, and doctors need to be trained with that, and that's a problem too. Many OBGYNs, including high risk doctors, are fleeing states with these severe laws, and we're going to see higher maternal mortality rates for a variety of reasons. But that's going to be one of them. Um, and uh, lastly, what was I going to say? Uh, uh, oh, I forgot now. What was the last thing you were talking about? Um, Parental consent was the last question. Oh, oh parental consent. That's right. And ironically, of course, if a minor is denied an abortion, then of course she eventually is considered a a emancipated minor because she has to make decisions for her own child that is eventually born, or even in things happening at and later on in pregnancy, like issues of of uh, say she. And needed a cesarean section, she would have to give permission and so forth. So it 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 is totally inconsistent this whole parental consent business. And and what one question to that to you, Lori, is uh, in the past, it is it still the case that that a a minor could seek uh, permission from a judge in the judicial system, which yeah. of course is a big hassle, but Exactly. Uh, but that is possible. It is possible. It's become more politicized. Uh, so, you know, recently, and this this wasn't in Michigan, but um, it was one of the surrounding states. Uh, recently, a minor navigated the courts and, and was successfully able to get before a judge. And I just I just want to say, like, I am 35 years old. And the thought of having to get a court order for anything overwhelms me. I, and I am not a pregnant minor. Like I just, I, I can't imagine having to to navigate all of that. Uh, but this, this young person did manage to get before a judge and was requesting judicial bypass to, to receive an abortion. And the judge denied it by saying, well, you're so mature. You managed to get before me. Surely you're mature enough to raise a child. Jesus. So, <laughs> Right, exactly. Who's so it has become. To realize she wasn't ready to raise a child. <laughs> right, exactly. That's my thing. Then she is also mature enough to recognize that this is not what she wants to do. Um, but so it it the the I mean this has always been the case, but I think we're seeing an uptick in um, a judge's personal anti-abortion beliefs playing into the judicial bypass decisions, um, and and therefore their their denials. So. Um, not yeah, good. it, it is still in, in place. But I again, I think that's part of the education that we have to do with people because people assume, oh, well, if you get up in front of the judge and they probably just say it's fine. And that's definitely not the case. So. Uh, Jan. Thank you. I wonder uh, if uh, others, the, I think there's four other states that uh, allow state Medicaid money to be used to pay for low income uh, procedures. And, um, I'm I'm wondering if they have had problems uh, with this or people trying to interfere with this because the money is a really big deal, and uh, for people to be able to afford uh, health care is a big deal no matter what. 
we looked at what other states did and and what challenges they had. Frankly, the the challenges that were most uh, raised for us wasn't really anyone interfering. Although, I mean, I will say that is a possibility, right? Like we have a very narrow pro-choice majority right now. If in the future anything changes, that ban can go back into place. Any of these laws can go back into place. That I mean, that is just, I'm not trying to be an alarmist here, um, but that is something that keeps me up at night. Any of the things that we have done thus far in this term can and likely would be overturned quickly. So, um, you know, bans can always go back into place. Um, but the the biggest issue that we heard was frankly a an order of operations thing. So, you know, lifting the ban, but not trying to deal with reimbursive reimbursement rates more proactively. And then that that limiting of access because facilities weren't able to to keep their lights on and, and stay open, um, which is why we're having a, a proactive bill as well and are trying to to have as many conversations as we possibly can proactively to 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 get that um addressed and get ahead of it. Well, I would I would love oh, to have a chance to uh, debate sorry. with those people who insist that the use of our tax money is an affront to the religious blah blah blah. Um, and I I have successfully challenged a number of these people. Show me where in your religion or any religion there is such a prohibition. And you know what? It, with the exception of what the Pope did in 1840. There isn't anything. They can't. They can't find anything to support their assertion. So all of this is piled on nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pile onto that, and I I do see uh, Dave your question, so maybe I'll save my comment for later. But uh, so Dave, you want to go ahead? I, I I had comments about religion as well as sexism when the way women are treated. But uh, Dave, what's your question or comment? Well, I've, I've been an uh, escort uh, from Planned Parenthood for, for years, and I can't remember ever seeing uh, a, 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 an opponent, uh, a right to lifer, that wasn't religious connected. I, my faith doesn't believe in abortion, so I changed my faith. Uh, it, it's something that for me, the, the young people today, I think that the people that are going to be supporting it are going to be fewer and fewer over the years. And as this old fart goes, there's going to, there's going to be, uh, there's, I got four grandchildren and all four of them are, are very, they're not religious. That's one of the problems, but all four are very pro-choice. Uh, that's not, not pro-abortion, but pro-choice. A woman should have the right to choose. I'm done. Thank you. Good. I'm glad you brought, brought that up. And I see Rich's hand up. And we've got a room for a couple more questions here, and then we'll we're going to say thank you for an amazing conversation, uh, Rich. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Very informative. Um, I'm a United Methodist clergyman, so I'm interested if there are other clergy or a clergy coalition who are backing reproductive rights. Um, do we have any uh, allies out there? Um, we do. Yeah, we do. There were some that actually came and, and put in cards of support. Um, I know, oh my goodness, I'm going to blank on the name. Um, but the I think the Jewish Interfaith Coalition uh, is one of them as well. But no, there were people that came and, and put in their cards as their organization, like their their religious affiliation, like for reproductive rights. So yes, they they definitely exist. And they, they were on the record as being supportive, which was really, really great. Because again, like... You, your your faith is your faith, but your faith doesn't dictate what you allow other people to do. And it was really, really great to have have folks come say that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, could I just mention the United Church of Christ also supports uh, reproductive rights. And in fact, that was our first resolution at our, our recent National Synod. And in fact, at that Synod, we honored the, it was in Indianapolis, and we honored the Indiana OBGYN who performed uh, an abortion on the 10 year old from Columbus who moved to Indiana and the Indiana uh, uh, Medical Board sanctioned her for doing the taking care of this patient, uh, in my view, totally unreasonably 
find her $3,000 and our church contributed $3,000 to the Indiana uh, 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 right to uh, abortion fund. I've got, I can't help myself, but I've got to say that Paul is uh, chair of uh, the Industry of Faith Reproductive Justice Coalition uh, with my other organization. And we had filed an amicus brief uh, last fall on behalf, we had people from around around 140 clergy from maybe 12 different denominations. So uh, you were one of those folks, Rich. So we have a, I have a database of clergy who from many different religions that support women's right to choose. And so we submitted also testimony from this interfaith coalition that said that uh, we believe in women's right to choose. We believe in the worth and dignity of women. So it's part of our religious beliefs that women should have this these rights. So I just wanted to say that because that's been an important part of my advocacy lately. Um, so I guess we have a couple more questions here and then we're gonna have to say thank you. But um, no, no, I guess there was the, the next step was also what can we do? So maybe uh, maybe Jessica, you can ask the question, but I think we, we need to know what next steps are beyond talking about the problem and the chance bills. So Jessica, can you give us a little short question? Hopefully. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't even a question. I just wanted to give a shout out to my own faith. I'm a Unitarian Universalist uh, church member, and that's something that I brought up a lot um, living in the area where I live is that um, reproductive justice is entirely consistent with my faith that, you know, the conservatives who do not want people to have access to abortion are don't get to claim the mantle of, you know, religion, because as you just pointed out, there are plenty of folks who feel that, you know, this kind of autonomy is absolutely consistent with their religious beliefs. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for saying that. I happen to be a UU advocate. So there we're on the same team there, Jessica. Awesome. Um, you, Lori, what's the next steps for to taking this ball forward? Because it, it has to be voted on yet. And, it does. And when will, do you have an idea when that might be coming up? And then uh, this Grey Panthers can take a position here that, of course, that we support these bills. Uh, at least I'm going to be recommending that to our board after this meeting. But what are some what are some advocacy steps for taking and, and it's got to go beyond the house as well as as well. So in addition to, to writing or reaching out to your own representatives, really focusing on the health policy numbers right now is important. That's the first that's that's the next immediate step is voting it out of that committee. Uh, and I think that that is going to be happening very, very shortly. Uh, as I said, I, I would love to say that we have all of our members who are completely comfortable with every aspect of this package, but you know there are some folks who have questions. So making sure that they hear from uh, the people of Michigan and um, you know know that they they their constituents want them to support it. It's really really important. So reaching out to the members of health policy is the the next uh, most helpful thing that we can do. And I've got the names and the. In the phone numbers of the members of the committee, if you, we can share that with people here as well. Thank you. Um, any other calls for action here? I think we're right at our time. And um, I guess I'm gonna say thank you. I, I see Mary Jo's finger up, but I don't know if that's a, if yes, it's- Yes, it is. It's a question. Okay. It's, real. it's, it's a legal question. I wanted to follow up because I guess when um, we were working for um, the ballot issue, uh, a few of us thought, well, you know, what are we going to do with all these uh, laws? And I guess I thought that it would involve lawsuits for each individual bill or, um, you know, uh, crazy uh, law. Is this like taking the place of that? Or do you know what I'm trying to say, Lori? I do. Um, and trying very carefully to not speak on behalf of the ACLU. Um, if we could take care of this on our own, we would save the state a lot of money for having to defend these law or th to, to defend these lawsuits, because I um, absolutely, I agree with you. I would expect them to be legally challenged as unconstitutional under prop three. 
Uh, and I am not a lawyer, so this is not a legal opinion, but I think that the state would lose. So, um, yes, the, I, I do think that if we were not proactively uh, trying to repeal these laws, there would probably already be a lawsuit in place. Uh, uh -huh. Again, that's just speculative. Uh, and yes, if if we can't get this done, then that is what we are leaving the state open to is a lawsuit against all of these bills. Thank mm -hmm. you. That's what I thought. Yes. I just want to make sure. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm going to say that we're going to offer you two things, Representative Pohutsky, in addition to our gratitude, which let's, why don't we all just either raise our hands or something to the effect to say, thank you, Lori, or thank you, Representative Pohutsky. Thank you. you. You've given us a lot of knowledge and your time on a Saturday, but you could be doing other things. But there isn't nothing more important that I could be doing right now than this, truly. So thank you all for giving me the opportunity. But uh, Gray Panthers is, is an intergenerational group. So we also are excited about the idea that you're in your 30s and you're doing this good stuff right now uh, too. So you, uh, Representative Paul Hutsky, thank is you. to make you an honorary member of Gray Panthers for one year without even have to pay dues to us Thank that's you. number one uh, action alert so part of our work is action that is our motto age and youth in action uh, secondly we do normally offer an honorarium that would go if since you're a highly paid uh, employee of the state uh, we won't be giving you an honorarium, but we will give an honorarium the charity of your choice. So if you can think about that and let us know what that would be, then we will try to be supportive with our with our dollars. Thank so you. that's our, our way of thanking you. And I want to also invite you or other people to stay on for the rest of our meeting. We do have things all affecting people here in Michigan and in the country. Uh, coming up here right now after your presentation. So you're welcome to stay, or uh, those of you who are on the call just to hear, Laurie, I'm inviting you to stay a little longer because we'll be hearing from uh, Rich Peacock on peace. Uh, we'll be hearing uh, from uh, Dave Ivers on the big uh, three uh, strike that's going on with UAW. These are some hot issues. We'll be having somebody from the Sierra Club that will be coming on and giving us updates on the environment. So we're more than one issue here. And again, thank you, Representative Polotsky. Thank you all so much. I, that's very all very thoughtful of you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm going to move us in then. Uh, and I'm, again, I'm in kind of appealing to those of you who are on the call to hear Lori to stay with us to, to hear some of the other things that we're doing or, or that we're caring about. Uh, we have, I'm the, happen to be the chair of a group called the National Council of Gray Panther Network. So there's Gray Panthers all over the country, and we have a council that meets every month to talk about issues. And one of the issues that actually could come back to this to haunt us as well is the Republicans have a budget proposal. We're, we're facing a, a government shutdown, almost certain to be some kind of government shutdown the way the folks are the the House Freedom Caucus. And they we had a, a, a whole budget a deficit limit last summer where we took advocacy to urge that they would not that they protect the rights of low income people, of moderate income people, and all, all those things. They they they're proposing like a 22% cut in the federal budget. And some of those other little rider things could also be anti-abortion in that budget bill. So it's something to think that it's not just the Michigan issue, but it's a nas national issue. I'll just say that there's two or three things that the National is our Issues Committee will be meeting on Monday. So here's some of the things that we're working on. Uh, one, we will be supporting a ban on assault weapons. And there are some national bills that have like uh, in the the House over 205 co-sponsors and another bill in the Senate with 44 co-sponsors. So it's an uphill battle. 
but I'll just say that we're, we're also involved with that as an issue. Uh, we also will be looking at the, trying to protect Social Security because even though, even though Social Security is, is kind of off budget, you can't, you can't cut back on your Social Security. They could have proposals in there that would uh, reduce the amount of money available to Social Security offices. So it would delay the time in which uh, you might be able to get help from Social Security due to the uh, federal budget thing. Uh, there is also this whole attempt to privatize Social Security that never seems to quite go away. Gray Panthers have always called for sta uh, standing firm at asking the not asking but demanding the well-off to pay their fair share of Social Security fringe benefits. So there are three different bills that would protect Social Security. And it's also in somewhat in sync with what the Bush, the, the Biden, excuse me, the Biden administration is talking about. So that's something that's coming up here with uh, the uh, at the national level. There's uh, gun violence is another thing, but we've um, I'll just say that. Let's see, we have. Um, so let's see. Okay, we have next presentation uh, by, there we go, oh, it's right in front of me. I, I misplaced my agenda, so pardon me for that. Uh, we have, uh, after this, we've got Rich Peacock will be giving us an update on peace issues, and I think it has something to do with nuke, diffusing nuclear weapons, which could be obviously a an impact on all of us that way too. So Rich, what's, what's your report? Thank you. I want you to know about peace action of Michigan's uh, September uh, focus. It is the diffuse nuclear war week of action. The threat of nuclear war has become more prominent and we need to uh, diffuse it. And so during the week of September 25 to 29, Monday through Friday, we will uh, send out emails each day with instructions of how to encourage our senators to do something to help prevent nuclear war. So we need for our government uh, to renounce firing first nuclear weapons. We need to end the sole authority of the president to launch an attack. We need to take nuclear weapons off trigger alert. We have some 400 of them, ICBMs on trigger alert. The problem is if the president gets the possibility of firing them, he has less than 30 minutes to make up his mind. So we need to take those off hair trigger alert. Uh, there are billions of dollars being planned to replace our entire nuclear arsenal. We need to cancel those plans. And finally, uh, our senators need to support the treaty and the prohibition of nuclear weapons. So I invite you to be a part of this diffused nuclear war week of action. And we will send you uh, five action ideas during the week of September 25 to 29. If you're not on Peace Action of Michigan's email list, I'll, I'll be glad to put you on it. Uh, just send me your email address. Um, you can send it to RJ Peacock at Huawei.com and a summary of my information I put in the chat. So it's in the chat and I'll be glad to hear from you and I'll be glad to take comments or questions. Sure. Are any questions here for Rich Peacock?
Well, thank you for the work you're doing, Ray. Uh, peace Action has been a, Gray Panther has been a close ally for working for peace for a, a long time, and we appreciate you keeping us up to date with some things. Um, the next item here will be an update on the UAW strike uh, and the big tree. So that's kind of front page news. And Dave Ivers, who's a longtime union activist, uh, was out there on the streets and would like to share his update. Good morning, everyone. We had a great presentation, and and thank you, Rich. Uh, I was I was a an old guy in submarines, and we had I was in conventional submarines. But the uh -huh. reality is that we have to stop it. You're absolutely right. I'm a I'm a proud submariner, but the reality is that we have to stop it. We have to now how it happens. We I don't know, but we have to keep working at it. We have to keep working at it. Uh, I was blessed to be able to be downtown last night for the. Uh, the rally in front of the UAW Ford Center. Uh, it used to be the Veterans Memorial Building years ago. Uh, incidentally, it was right next to the uh, opening of the auto show, the preview thing. And, and uh, it was really funny that literally, literally there were thousands of people there for the rally to hear Bernie Saunders and, and other UAW officials, including the president, uh, talk, talk about the, the big three and corporations. And here we had people in tuxedos and, and long gowns walking right by us. So it was it was a good afternoon, good evening. Uh, Bernie Saunders uh, talked about the what's happened in the last 50 years. Uh, and he, he said, for, for instance, he talked about the fact that, that 50 years ago, the average CEO made 30 times what the average worker made. Today, the average CEO makes 300 to 400 times what, what the average worker made. And, and the reality for for all of us is that we're making less, I should say, most of us aren't working anymore. I'm sure not. Um, but I, I saw I saw a, a, a world where when I was when I was younger, my my wife never had thought about working until the kids were halfway grown and uh, she wanted to be independent and get a job. but but today, today you have to have two earners in the family to make it. And that, that's what the OEW strike is about. They want to be where they were 40 years ago, 50 years ago. The, they, uh, the average auto bill worker today is making less than, than he or she did 40 years ago. That's a, just a fact. And they don't have a pension. I know that's a that's a word that, you, that all of us understand what, what a pension is, especially a defined benefit pension. And the UAW, I don't, I, I, I am very supportive of them, but I think that they're, uh, they're asking for an awful lot at one time. Uh, the uh, right now, five percent of uh, of an employee's wages goes to a four hundred one k of their choice, uh, that by the employer. But as we've all seen, uh, four four hundred one ks or our savings plans go up and they go down and they go you know, go back and forth. Uh, what what the, the UAW is asking for is a defined benefit pension plan, which a lot of us work most of our life with uh, I'm 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 blessed to have a, a pretty good one and uh, it's, it's something that for me what they're asking for is is we we deserve what we had in the past and I've heard an awful lot of anti anti UAW stuff about the four-day work week the four-day work week isn't isn't an intent to 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 just help UAW workers it's intent to help other people get jobs if if we get to we Walter Ruther started it and and uh, decades ago, Walter Ruther said that he wanted a four day work week so that so people can enjoy their leisure time and have the time to go fishing to go up north to to, uh, to be with the family, but the main reason was to get full employment. He he believed that the best way to get everyone working is to make the work week shorter. Uh, because technology has changed the world, you know. In this country, we like to blame the the Chinese and the Vietnamese and all that stuff, but it's not that. It's technology that's that's, that's reduced it. Uh, we don't we don't like to face that. We can't get mad at people that look different than us if if uh, if if, uh, if it has to be technology. But that's what it's all about. And and uh, I thought I, it was a really good program. There, I I think I was. I was most impressed with the fact of how many young people were there. The uh, 
uh, I'm used to being at picket lines and rallies uh, for a lot of years. And usually it's not even the new employees. It's just the older folks that's, that have that recognize how important the union is and recognize how important it is to to show up. They they uh, they they were they uh, they were there. But in, uh, last night that I would I would say the overwhelming majority not overwhelming better than fifty percent of the people were were under twenty five or thirty. I mean th these these are all probably third or fourth tier UAW employees. They're saying, darn it, I'm doing the same work as the man or woman next, right next to me. And yet I'm making, in some cases, $15 an hour less, $10 an hour less. That's what this is really about. And I, I think that we heard a good thing. And, and Bernie Saunders, again, he's, he's just wonderful. But what, what, what he implied, he, he talked more generically about American workers and how they're getting screwed. I mean, there's no other word for it. The, the, uh, it in the 80s, we came up with the, the CEOs getting, getting instead of, instead of uh, all their money in a pay, they got money for stocks, stock options. And so that soon started buybacks and, and things to increase the stock value. And who cares about the workers? And it's a uh, minute. I go back to a time when Ford Motor Company would tell you their number one their, their number one person was the customer, the number two person was the employees, and the number three person was the community. And most of us are old enough to remember when Ford didn't want to pay their thing, their their fees to Dearborn, and they went to went to court on it because they thought they were being taxed too much. This is the reality that it changed. And I'm, well, I'm going to I'm going to elaborate on it. Uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Newt. I call him gentleman. Newt Gingrich that changed the whole thing uh, by by saying by saying we don't need we don't need to help the worker and so we've been we've been slipping down for for decades so I'm I'm very proud of what what the UAW is doing I think they're biting off a little more than they can chew but I think I want them to get as much as they possibly can and I'm done with that oh, oh and I got to give a little report on Social Security any, oh, I guess there's any questions. I guess so. Uh, Randy gave a, a pretty good report on what's happening. The the House Freedom Caucus, uh, they're, they're they're worse than the Tea Party was a decade ago. Uh, they they uh, they they want to change change the retirement age for Social Security to sixty nine. Uh, they want to lower the Kohler formula. Uh, it's not good now, but they're gonna they want to reduce it even further. Uh, that that'd be for people on Social Security. And you get an annual increase, and they won't even lower that more. And they want, like, like uh, again, what Randy mentioned, they want to cut all spending except on defense. Uh, they they want to increase defense spending, and very often uh, that's a, an aside. Very often the uh, our Congress gives gives the defense, uh, mostly contractors and the, the the military, more than they even asked for. And that's uh, that's because of the crazies out there. Um, President Biden, I think it was just Thursday night, uh, asked that the why, why don't why don't we pass an interim spending bill so that we can get past this, hoping that uh, that cooler heads will prevail and maybe the the House Freedom Caucus won't won't have the power that uh, they they appear to have now over the Speaker of the House. Uh, that's it for me. Okay, this is a great time for questions. And Dave, you brought up such an important issue that has to do with uh, workers as well as our social security. Are there some questions or comments for Dave? Are you all just uh, sitting back with amazement here? You know, uh, but no, it's it, we're we're trying to deal with some big issues on in Gray Panthers, so. Thank you, Dave, for giving a firsthand report on that. Um, we did have somebody who was coming in for the environmental justice. I'm not sure that Fred Miller is from Sierra Club is going to make it here unless there's somebody else that's coming in his place. So we won't have that. Um, we 
do have, you know, one of the things Gray Panthers has been following is the right to a, a access to affordable water. I mean, it gets down to such a really basic level. We take it for granted that that um, we can turn on the tap and we've got water or we can take a shower. Uh, but uh, Paul and I have been involved with a group called the People's Water Board. And I was had asked Paul if he could give us a little update on that there's there's so many opportunities going on right now in Michigan that it's kind of makes your head spin. But tell us more what's happening on the on the campaign for access to affordable water, Paul. Okay, thanks. Um, and similarly to the Reproductive Health Act, there is a packet of bills having to do with water affordability and and uh, uh, a right to, I guess, a right to a general right to water for everyone. You know, like air, we should certainly have a right to breathe clean air. We should have a right to um, safe and affordable water. Uh, but this package of bills is being worked on uh, with uh, the People's Water Board is working with uh, State Senator Stephanie Chang has been the the uh, prime champion of of affordable water in Lansing. And, and as I said, there's a whole packet of bills that are going on right now. Uh, and they would like to uh, have a statewide water affordability uh, program uh, somewhat akin to what has been started after many years of, of lobbying in Detroit for uh, a, uh, uh, a water affordability plan based on income. And there uh, actually the bill in Detroit has three tiers and the statewide bill would have two uh, based on a percent of poverty level so that the the lowest income group would pay no more than $18 a month for water. It's also being pegged as a percentage of income, uh, no more than two or 3% uh, so that hopefully everyone can then afford water. Another aspect of the plan, the lifeline plan in Detroit is that uh, no matter how many individuals may be in a given household, that they all be, if they're to qualify for that low rate, they all be allowed to use up to 1,250 gallons per month per person. Uh, and also, I think a very important aspect of these affordable water plans is to, if people are qualified and sign up, that they will be allowed to have their arrears forgiven. And sometimes there have been crazy bills like uh, ten, twelve thousand dollars or more, which none of us could easily afford, readily afford. And especially if you are at the poverty level yourself, there there's absolutely no way. So those those bills need to be forgiven. And some of them have happened in crazy ways that are are not easily explainable, perhaps because of even leaks in the system leading to the the uh, uh, personal water use. Uh, now to facilitate things in Detroit, the People's Water Board is planning a community resource fair um, in line with the um, uh, Detroit, uh, the, or the Wayne Metro Community Action Agency, which is the agency which has been hired by the Detroit Water Department to to sign people up for the Lifeline uh, Water Affordability Program. And this is at Central United Methodist Church on September 21st from 4 to 7 p.m. Michigan Welfare Rights is also a sponsoring organization. Uh, so if you know anybody in the Detroit system that uh, needs to sign up please urge them to do so to go to this go to this uh 
water affordability fair. Uh, another another event coming up is is going to be another showing of the film Who's Water on October third uh, by Detroit Jews for Justice at the downtown synagogue. And on October twelfth. Uh, is Lansing Legislative Day. So I, I imagine this would apply to, to many social justice organizations. Um, uh, but in specific, the People's Water Board wants to support the Hamtramck water issues, which are even more egregious than in Detroit. So that's about it. And if anybody has any questions? Any questions for Paul about water? Water justice. There's a lot of work goes on to make make justice. It isn't a matter of just talking, is it, Paul? No, no. And um, I'm grateful. But all this all this action has come to fruition, though. In this, you know, for years we've worked on these issues and and the and getting the lifeline plan in Detroit, getting concessions for that. That's after decades of of work, and also. You know, all the things happening in Lansing now that we've worked on for years on so many issues. We finally had a change in the makeup of the of the legislature. And that was, of course, due to I, I give credit to uh, uh, voters, not politicians that ended up with the the uh, stopping gerryman gerrymandering in the state, which is a huge problem, for example, in our sister state of Wisconsin, where. The Republicans have effectively controlled everything uh, because they've gerrymandered the districts. And even though most residents vote for a certain party, the other party always wins. That's not democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments, Dave? Uh, for Paul, uh, they, you mentioned October 3rd at the downtown synagogue. I mean, they just went through a two-year remodel I, I i'm interested in that does it they're going to show uh, film there it says at the isaac agree downtown synagogue uh -huh. i'm familiar with it yeah. yeah so that's what you're talking about so maybe yeah, yeah. what time is it it's uh october 3rd at 6 p.m uh i've seen that film the people's water board has presented it. it's um uh, uh what's her name levy a filmmaker has worked on this for years and it is really opens your eyes, not only about the problems in Michigan, but many other areas of the country uh, where where basic, uh, safe, affordable water is is uh, hard to come by. Thank you. Yeah. Well, like I said, Paul and I have been involved with through uh, through a faith lens involved with uh, standing up for people's right to have access to water. Um, I'm going to say welcome to Fred Miller here. He's taken some time out of his Saturday to be able to update us from the Sierra Club on environmental issues. So, Fred, what's what's on deck? Hi, Randy and everybody. Um, uh, well, I have a couple of things, I, I guess, that are top of the of the list right now. Now, one, of course, is the UAW strike. Um, which has an intricate relationship to the environment, clean energy, and climate change, um, with the auto companies claiming they can't pay out a reasonable uh, rise in uh, um, hourly uh, rates or get rid of uh, the uh, hated tier system of pay because they need to spend all of their money in the transition to electric vehicles, uh, ignoring just how much they've made in profits and, and how big um, the top rank salaries are. Um, but so it, it, on the other side, I think it's extremely important that people and organizations that support the transition to electric vehicles recognize all the difficulties that that creates for auto workers, uh, particularly with the uh, rise of battery factories um, that essentially replace the engine plants, but are 
um, generally being built on a non-union basis. That is, they're uh, joint ventures uh, that are outside UAW contracts. It's extremely important if we're to, uh, you know, develop and nurture uh, support for the, en the energy transition that it be done in a fair uh, manner that preserves uh, and and enhances, um, you know, working people security. Um, I posted um, in the chat a piece written um, that was uh, published in the Bridge Magazine online, um, written by uh, one of the uh, leaders of the Michigan Sierra Club's um, legislative and political efforts. Um, and uh, that, I think, gives you a good you know, sort of overview of of the importance and, and the approach that the Sierra Club, at least, and I think some of the other environmental groups are taking to supporting the, the UAW um, and explaining um, the relationship of um, um, their strike and the effort to quickly transition the economy. Uh, on a related note, um, the effort to get strong clean energy legislation, climate legislation out of the legislature um, is coming to a head in Lansing. There are packages of clean energy bills um, and community solar legislation in front of both the House and Senate. There's a lot of action behind the scenes by utilities and fossil fuel interests um, to uh, into the protections that, they, that extend the timeline for getting rid of uh, coal plants, for transitioning to 100% clean energy, uh, make it easier for the utilities to, to keep using some of their fossil fuel facilities longer. Um, that's all going on. And we, we've had some indication in the state center that's having an effect. Um, so it's really an, an important time to let uh, both state senators and state representatives know that you want strong clean energy legislation uh, that preserves the, the shortest time frames that have been written into the draft bills and the bills that are, were originally introduced as they were introduced um, uh, for, for that transition um, and gives the power to the Michigan Public Service Commission and the duty um, to consider and, and, uh, and affect uh, climate and all of its rulings. Those are like key components of these legislation. Um, the, um, um, the, the whole community of environmental organizations and climate action groups um, is uh, descending on Lansing a week ah. from next Tuesday, the 26th, uh, all day, starting in nine, nine to five you know, for um, meetings with legislators for um, rallies and speeches and music and um, and a presence to let the legislature know how important this is um, at, on the grounds of the uh, uh, Capitol, Hanson. And so I would urge I put up one I can one form there are actually several I think out there this one. I think is one that was posted by the Citizens Climate Lobby. Whichever one you use, um, it's you don't have to sign up, but if you do, you'll you know you'll get some more information, um, and they'll you know uh, probably uh, you know send you uh, a reminder if you need it. It's obviously coming up very soon. So, um, but that's you know the best chance we've had uh, with a legislature that is 
course, uh, you know, uh, majority committed verbally to um, the environment and climate action on, in both the House and Senate. And yet uh, it, it could go by with a watered down version of what uh, what we really need. So this is the point to get into it. Um, so those are the two things I'm 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 here to talk about. But I'll and try to answer any questions you have about anything else. Well, it's time for questions here. Fred's uh, obviously on top of a lot of things, and we appreciate him bringing that knowledge to our the table. Uh, are there is there anyone else who may not have thought about the connection between uh, the big three auto strikes? And uh, in environmental justice, I'm just I'm just saying I didn't automatically make the connection like I could have, and I'm just raising saying that's a confession on my part. But um, are there other people here that want to ask a question or offer a comment to Fred because he's a volunteer like the rest of us? Okay. okay. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple more things, another thing, and then if you all are doing, we're, we're multitasking people, aren't we? We're involved with a lot of issues, uh, but one issue that kind of got at to where I think Paul was talking about here, we all know, and I think our speaker also said that all these wonderful reforms that we might be getting, let's say we're we keep we continue to, to have success in the Michigan legislature, whether it's through reproductive rights, whether it's environmental justice, whether it's a basic kind of core concerns about um, uh, water justice. Uh, all those things can be you know, rescinded if we have people who get elected to office and then they they take over the majority and then they could. They could, it's a big tug of war going on about what's justice in, in, our, in Michigan. Uh, now, so there is a lot of voting rights, voting related legislation that have been introduced so far, and some of them have already been ex put into law. But one of those that I think is, is it was significant to me, and there's a person from a group called All Voting is Local that was asking if we could, if I could get involved with supporting a bill called the Michigan Voting Rights Act. And that you might remember back in the, for those of us who are old enough to remember Martin Luther King or read about him, but there was a, there's a US Voting Rights Act that basically said that if you, um, if you're a state uh, or a community that wants to start up gerrymandering or, or otherwise rigged elections. And that's what we're concerned about here at the national level, uh, that, that that should not be legal. You, 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 should not, you should have to get permission from somebody before you can set up a system that steers people, especially people who are black and brown, people who might have disabilities from being able to even vote, that this, there, there's a, a bill out there now called the Michigan Voting Rights Act to restore some of those kind of voting rights that were have been taken away over the last 10 years or so. And it's called Senate Bill 401, 402, 403, 404. And I'll just mention it to you. There, there's not an action going on right now for this, but it's just something that I'm going to predict that there will be some actions later on. They somehow believe that they can get this passed this fall, but I haven't seen a national alert yet to do that. But this Michigan Voting Rights Act, number one, would make it illegal for uh, having systems that would cancel out or minimize the voting power of black and brown voters, keeping them from electing their pro protect the elected candidates. So it's protections for racial justice protections through the Michigan Voting Rights Act. It's in, in case that things keep getting worse at the federal level, we'll still have some voting rights here in Michigan. Uh, number two, it would make it easier for voters experiencing uh, to discrimination to fight back in courts. 
Uh, number three, it would expand protections for voters so who don't speak English as their primary language. So if you were, say, Hamtramck, or if you were in other cities where you spoke non-English, that you should have access to ballots that were in your language. Uh, they would be helping, uh, again, as I mentioned, the system of pre-clearance, meaning if you're going to start a law, maybe it's, I think there was Gross Point area was having some laws that were considered to be discriminatory, but that could be challenged in a, and the Secretary of State is involved with this. And then it would be adding for um, some state, some research and enforcement tools for a statewide database for in terms of Democrats and voting. So there, the, a lot of the things that we're working for could be undone depending on who's in office. And we're not saying to vote Democrat, but I'll say it as an individual that there's, you're more likely to get some things that you're looking for if you have people who are more on the progressive side of the range to get elected. So as we get closer to 2024, things are happening this year to protect voting rights. And it's there's bills in Michigan that are happening to do that right now. So that's my report on one of those many bills that are out there to protect voting rights in Michigan. Uh, any questions on that Michigan Voting Rights Act? We're at this point where people could like it say, oh my God, one more, one more cause. But I think that's, to me, it's a big one. Um, yeah. Dave? Who is behind that? Who is pushing that? Um, well, it's is it uh, voters, not politicians. Or? I would have to look up. I think it's well, we've got there's several sponsors for this, and one of them is our state. Let's see. Uh, our state representative from South, Senator from Southfield. I'm not clicking on his name right now. Are, are you talking about Jeremy Moss? Yes. Jeremy Moss is kind of like a kind of chair of a voting committee at the state level. Okay. Um, I've, been, I've been doing more searching on this information than a lot of other things over the last week or two. But there is a number of progressive legislators. I can't re remember the name right now, but that was a good question. I'll try to get the updated information about that voting rights. Thank act. you. Uh, I do have an announcement uh, that there is a group that I'm working with that's working on a, a faith summit related to LGBTQ uh, rights and inclusion and you can know that right now we all know i think that uh, in addition to being scapegoating people who are black and brown uh, as, as, a, as an election strategy tool there's also scapegoating people who are transgender or people from the lgbt communities so i've been working with a coalition that's planning to have a forum coming up a a conference coming up on October 27th. So it's a ways off. It's a faith summit on LGBT inclusive, inclusivity and acti activism. So I'll be helping do a workshop on doing legislative advocacy on behalf of the LGBT communities. And so I can get more information. They just got their registration uh, website for that event approved just yesterday. So that's something else that's coming up here that seeing um, human rights through the lens of religion uh, is, is it's not just right-wing religion, it's a whole range of religions that do believe in human dignity. And so that's another event that's coming up. We've been having little uh, forums uh, online as well, looking at, for example, one forum coming up on disability. How do, how do people of faith treat people who might have a, a handicap or a disability and that, that can be 
we, we have to be looking at people as people rather than just people as categories. So that's that's another area of interest. Uh, do we have any other announcements for today's meeting? I mean, we covered a lot of territory. So if not, I, I, you, you, yeah. you never got a treasurer's report. Oh my gosh. Well, that comes up in our board meeting, Paul, Paul, Dave. Dave, yeah, sorry. But if you wanted to share something. Oh, right, no, no, that's, that's, we're fine. That could be part of our board meeting. That's, yeah. I'm sorry. A board that meets at around noon it's today. Things along. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. So uh, this is this, this whole session is being recorded thanks to Danny, and Danny has been taking all will be our secretary taking notes. So Danny Foster is our Generation Z uh, person who's doing outreach to younger people because it, you can't be just older folks talking about what we ought to do. We need to have younger people and their vision and their ideas. So I'm very grateful to Danny Foster. And I just want to sh do a shout out right now to you, Danny. But um, so we're we're moving ahead. And I think Great Panthers is kind of unique in, in a certain way that we're looking at so many issues. There's a lot of one issue organizations that do a good job, maybe working on gun violence, maybe environment. And there's plenty of things in reproductive justice, but we're one of those groups that tries to do a lot of different pieces. So thank you, Rich, for sticking with us as well, and also Fred. But um, if there is no further, um, I'm we're going to we're going to record this. This meeting is being recorded. And then we'll be able to share that. We have a Gray Panthers has a list of close to 300 people. So those who didn't show up or couldn't show up for this meeting will get a chance to see what you all have been talking about during this hour. And so we can share that online, uh, that the bit, uh, the, a video of today's meeting with people with about almost 300 people around uh, Southeastern Michigan. So. Again, that's a thank you. Any last questions or comments? If not, this meeting is adjourned. And those of you who are board members, it looks like we have enough board members to make a quorum here. Uh, but let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have enough people for a quorum for our board meeting. So we're gonna come back at noon to start our board meeting and uh, Again, thank you all for being part of this meeting. Your ideas matter and our ideas matter. So thank you. So I will see does you. Anyone, um, before we end, does anyone disapprove of me stopping the recording so I'm able to multitask and type notes during the meeting? Yeah. Am I good to stop recording? Okay. That we won't be recording our board meetings with a video. It will just be the recording of the, the public meeting. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and stop this then, and it'll upload after we end the meeting later. Okay. All right. Thank you.